It's really nice to be here together in the flesh. I'd like to welcome you all, you all as well as our roundtable participants. Today I can say that I am honored to be sitting at the table of the cool people. Our guests today come from a variety of practices and backgrounds, but they all have one thing in common. They are skilled critical thinkers engaging with the topic of AI and algorithms. So I will introduce everyone in strict alphabetical order, the most democratic of all taxonomies. <laughs> Arif Conway, Arif is a PhD candidate at Kim Kai AM, a research group on critical artificial intelligence at the Karlsruhe University of Arts and Designs. Design. He has been teaching at the Design Lab Department of the Gerrit, uh, Ritfeld Academy and is now teaching at the basic, basic year. Arif is also the co-founder of the online radio platform IIIR, Main, Main, Main. We have Mariana Fernandez Mora, who is a visual artist and researcher based in Amsterdam. She's interested in dynamics of power, algorithms, and the relation between geographical and digital landscapes. With a background in architecture, her work usually involves interdisciplinary installations that search to give body to the videos she creates. In 2018, she graduated from the Garrett Riffel Academy, and currently she's part of the master's program F for Fact at the Sandberg Institute, where she's researching our um, intimate and sometimes problematic relationships with technology and co-writing her thesis with natural language processors like GPT-3 and Replica. Meta Haven, Daniel van der Velden, um, the work of Meta Haven consists of filmmaking, writing, and designing. Films by Meta Haven include Chaos Theory, 2021, Hometown, 2018, Eurasia, Questions on Happiness, and Information Skies from 2016, nominated uh, for the 2017 European Film Award, Awards. Solo exhibitions of Meta Haven include past phrases, State of Concept at Athens in 2021, Turnarounds, Efflux, New York 2019, Version History at the ICA in London in 2018, Earth at the Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam 2018, Hometown Isoli Liaxia in Kiev 2018, and Islands in the Cloud, MOBA PS1, New York 2013. Public lectures include An Evening with Meta Haven the, at the Museum of Modern Art, New York 2019, After the Sprawl at Castello de Rivoli in Turin 2019, and Inhabitant, Harvard GSD, Cambridge 2020. Recent publications include PSYOP, an anthology, 2018, edited with Karen Archie and Digital Tarkovsky, 2018. Rodrigo Ochigame, an assistant professor in the Institute of Cultural Anthropology and Depart Development Sociology at Leiden University, the Netherlands. Uh, Rodrigo's research examines unorthodox models of computational rationality such as non-classical logics from Brazil, non-binary Turing machines from India, and frameworks of information science from Cuba. Ochigaman received a BA with highest honors from the University of California, Berkeley, and a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, that is MIT. I would also like to thank our research coordinator, Eva Hornhout, without whose incredible organizational skills, events such as this one would not happen. Graduating from Sandberg Institute and AKA St. Jost, Eva is a multidisciplinary artist, often using sculpture, objects, and action that stem from everyday situations. In her process, she considers the copy and paste operation as a generative process, as a possibility to question and reconsider existing ideologies and concepts that are present in our society. Throughout the process of creating an, an artwork, Eva uses decontextual, deco 
contextualization of observations and experiences in order to create meaningful connections and initiate dialogues. We are so lucky to have her as a coordinator. So why a round table about human writing system? What is this all about? I circle back to certain ideas that have been foundational to my work trying to understand AI, algorithms, and technology in general. What started more than half a decade ago as a rather timid exploration of big data as a colonial operation of resource extraction became an extensive research on what I then called the coloniality of the algorithm, taking on Aníbal Quijanos and Maria Lugones' seminal work on coloniality and the inception of capital in the Americas. I anchored most of my research on these thinkers who gave me a perspective to understand AI, not as a novelty technology, but as part of a historical continuum in which algorithms cannot be separated from the taxonomical order that set the basis for the human classification system underpinning the colonial enterprise. If Quijano and Lugones gave me the initial grounding for this historical perspective, it was Achille and Mandler who helped me understand the contemporary uses of AI and algorithms in the administration of life. It was through the necropolitical that I situated the algorithm as part of the decision-making process of who may live and who must die. When the pandemic lockdown was declared in the Netherlands in March 2020, like everyone else, I was reading the first analysis of the unprecedented situation that we found ourselves in. I practically disengaged from social media at that point, intermittently sharing some tidbits here and there because I did not want to participate in the constant churning of opinion. I am, generally speaking, interested in longer arcs, processes that can only be explained through longer observations, patterns, and preceding events. Social media forces me to live in the now, a perpetual moment of reaction tied to the present. It was in April 2020 that Achille Mende published the Universal Right to Brief, a text that will eventually be another turning point in my own work ever since. In the Universal Right to Brief, member writes, try as we might to rid ourselves of it. In the end, everything brings us back to the body. We try to graft it onto other media, to turn it into an object body, a machine body, a digital body, an ontophanic body. I paused when I read these sentences. I couldn't quite grasp what he meant by the ontophanic body. It was Stéphane Vial, professor at the School of Design at the University of Quebec in Montreal, who first introduced the notion of ontophany, first in a paper he published in 2018 and later in his book Being and the Screen. Vial says, Two decades of daily cultural integration with interfaces have demonstrated that virtuality or simulation is one of many aspects of our interactive experience with digital devices. A need therefore exists for new concepts, once more apt at penetrating the philosophical complexity of the digital phenomenon and more likely to enlighten us as to the significance of our interactions with interfaces, given that these encounters constitute a phenomenological and existential experience. Thus, Vial says, I have suggested introducing the concept of ontophany, whose etymology merges without any particular hierarchical distinction, the dimensions of being, the ontos, and of appearance, the final. It bears witness to my profound attachment to Bachelard's notion of phenomenal technique, which I believe, and this, are, this is a quote from Stefan Vial's uh, work, which I believe the term ontophony revives and broadens into a form of comprehensive phenomenal technique. Not only do the following theoretical propositions seek to contribute 
philosophically to internet studies and to a better understanding of the digital age. They also hope to give rise to a broader deliberation on technology and perception as they relate to an approach that he would characterize as a historical phenomenology of technology. According to this approach, technology is no longer a body of objects isolated from their subject. Technical nature becomes an intrinsic aspect of subjectivity, which varies in relation to its historical context. <clears throat> man is as much part of the machine as the machine is part of man. And here is the core of my interest in ontophany. I have said before in lectures, some of you attended last year or the year before, that the virtual is a concept that can no longer be used to describe our relationship with technology. I will now posit that the virtual has been replaced by the ontophany, that is, technology as intrinsic to subjectivity. I go back to Royal and his focus on appearance, which he says that he calls ontophany, the process through which the being appears to us in, a, in the sense that it involves a particular quality of being in the world, as Heidegger would say, or I would say, not being Heidegger, but quite like, <laughs> feeling in the world rather than being in the world. And I have to go back to Mendes' lectures on Heidegger and technology, where he calls technology a way of thinking. And he points that through technology, a concealment takes place, a realm where truth happens and which is the event of truth. Technology then has a power to generate ontophany or phenomenality, the power to generate what can appear as real through perception. All phenomena, and not only scientific phenomena, are constructed or co-constructed by technical factors. The fact of appearing as either human or non-human is in itself a phenomenological process. There are technical structures of perception. Any ontophany is itself conditioned by technique. The art posits that through the ages, new technologies have generated an ontophanic shift. That is to say, a shaking of the dominant technical structures of perception, and consequently, a change of the very idea that we have of reality. Each time, it requires from us to relearn the whole perception process and to extend our idea of the real. Some of you might remember that I have spoken about the processes of violence that happen on social media. This rhetoric of violence that are used under the guise of free speech. And we could say that these forms of violence can no longer be considered virtual or quote unquote social media based, but that they are part of this process that Vial calls a phenomenological violence due to its impact on our subjectivity. So this introduction is a long way to explain how I came into the notion of the human rating system and what I was hoping to describe with this rather, rather absurd title. If the, ontophany, if the ontophanic body is a body that can no longer be separated from the technology it interacts with, I am interested in how the constant rating of human performance impacts our subjectivity, and ultimately how it impacts the value of human life and our own self-worth. At the same time, the state itself applies a value system of life <laughs> through its interventions, which would be too long to enumerate in this short introduction, but relevant in our ongoing discussions of pandemic politics. What I call the human rating system is the numeric value reflected in number of likes, number of YouTube reproductions, social media metrics, the number of stars we give an Uber driver, the shares and likes in Instagram stories. And since we are at an academic institution, I should mention platforms or initiatives like Rate My Tutor 
that further expand the logic of the market into education, exacerbating precarious labor conditions through the fear of getting a quote-unquote bad rating from students who see themselves as deserving of a better service. It is through this ubiquitous valuation practice that platforms and apps have created a system of hierarchies and strata to measure life's worth. This rating system places us in a permanent state of evaluation of ourselves and of everyone we interact with. If the algorithm is built on a colonial taxonomical system that classified us across racial and gender lines in order to optimize capitalism's labor exploitation and to set the political basis for the enslavement of black people or the indentured servitude for natives in the, Amer in the Americas, to give two examples, and eventually through resource extraction, the human ratings system is nothing more than the logic of the algorithm intervening in human subjectivity to expand this project of valuation of human life that has been instrumental to the capitalist administration of life itself. Are you a five-star human? In the movie of your life, what would your Rotten Tomatoes score be? Thank you. function creep and um, essentially it's a term for change or breakdowns in algorithmic systems um, and I arrived at this, this term because I was thinking about uh, indeterminacy I was reading about indeterminacy and about agential realism and I was kind of trying to understand um, how we can talk about um, also algorithmic systems and these rating systems as um, systems <coughs> that change so phenomena, if you want, that always uh, interact with others and that, um, I guess, uh, change based on those interactions that come out of those interactions. Um, and then if you look at how these systems are uh, presented, then you find a term like function creep, because actually these terms are presented as if they do exactly one thing, right? So if they, as a software does exactly what it's supposed to do. So uh, I guess they're presented to us as fixed, at least by the actors that kind of push them or develop them. So I'm not sure if you can read this, I hope so, but it essentially says that the purpose and the use, so the, let's say the design of a system and the use in, in the wild are perfectly aligned. Right? Um, so for example, um, if uh, or there, there was a Dutch contact tracing app, there still is a Dutch contact and when the Dutch government thought about um, designing that or um, maybe launching that, they uh, had an advisory report from an IT firm that said the likelihood of function creep is very low. So the likelihood that this app will be used for something else than just letting you know that you were in contact with someone uh, is very low. So it will do kind of only that. It will only be used for contact tracing. So but then um, classification systems, they change, right? So they change because of technical changes, because they break maybe, but also because the categories change. So um, maybe because categories are added or also because uh, the political circumstances just change. So a category that maybe is 
uh, A today can, can mean something else tomorrow, right? Or it can be used for exclusions. So these are maybe kind of basic observations, but if you look into like the technical discourse, then it's just assumed that a, a system does what it's designed to do. Um, yeah, and um, I guess so that means that change is, is presented as, as controllable also. So even if there is change, function creep, right, then that's treated as an exception. So that there is an acknowledgement of change, but that change is treated as something that can be controlled and can be reined in. Right? So the way that then a function creep is presented in a way is this. So it's like a divergence of the purpose and of the use of a system. Um, and if that seems a bit like formalist, that's also because it is, right? So they, they think about the uh, kind of form and the content maybe of a, of a message, let's say, but not about the context. Right? So, um, yeah, and, and that term is used um, a lot when the functionality kind of widens, so when there's privacy infringement. Um, and I guess an example is that, let's say you do online shopping and you have your data in, the, in a database of an online shop. Uh, and then that's usually meant to, for you to pay and to get the product that you ordered, right? Mm -hmm. But then um, we can also uh, think of scenarios where all that data can be used to do something else. So for example, to predict your health based on your purchase history. Uh, and then that would be called function creep because that's not what the initial purpose was. And um, there is also legislation against this uh, that's called purpose limitation. That is, for example, in the GDPR, um, and general data regulation of the European Union that says that if we collect data, then that should only be used for something specific. Um, but the way that this is controlled is totally unclear, because also data is kind of peculiar in that we don't really know uh, where data is copied. So you can steal data and it's still in the same place. Right? So uh, yeah, I, I keep going back to this concept because that kind of struck me as strange. Um, and so, Let's see, I, I guess we can, we can um, call this kind of way of thinking about systems as an internal, like a technical only approach. So thinking only about the machine and not about the relation of the human and the machine, right? Um, and um, let me look at my notes for a second. So yeah, I think it also, maybe also being here, it also suggests the kind of, um, that, that malfunctions are exceptions, but also that the repurposing of technology is something uh, strange, but if you think about a lot of innovation, a lot of artistic practice that kind of like serves on the repurposing of of technical devices, right? And for example, in music, there are constantly things used for different purposes than uh, than they are designed to. So in Acid House, for example, there is a uh, the, like the finding the sound of Acid House comes from a really cheap bass guitar uh, emulation that kind of failed in the usual. Um, yeah, and so, do I have to get closer to the mic? That helps. <laughs> For the street. I didn't know. Welcome. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, so <laughs> systems change all the time. And, um, and especially in algorithmic systems do, because algorithms are uh, multi-purpose, so they're actually designed to be multifunctional. Okay? Um, and so, uh, if we if we start to think about function creep like that, then um, I would say function creep is not a malfunction, but it's uh, maybe a moment where the kind of computational infrastructure that rates us, that classifies us, um, lets its guard down, or where we can see how it's working. Um, so there's a, a quote by Stan and Rulader where they say that infrastructure becomes visible on breakdown, and um, function creep is basically such a breakdown. So what becomes visible in these moments of, of function creep, uh, for example, when privacy is infringed, uh, is actually the kind of interest that govern the system, on also the technical like, the materialities that govern the system. Um, and also the norms, basically, that, that are kind of, that have helped to set up the way that the systems function. Um, and so then, I guess in these moments of breakdown, we can see how bodies are affected by it and how maybe uh, 
rating systems that say usually are kind of obscure about how they uh, how they affect us. Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah, I was thinking about function like how else can we use it? And uh, I think rather than comparing simply like the purpose and the actual use, um, what it allows us to do is is read a kind of a difference be between the declared intent, so the purpose or the design of the technology, and the underlying disposition. And so, um, with disposition, I kind of mean the inclination uh, of a system, so possible functions, also hypothetical functions, and uh, also the kind of political economic interests that that make up a system or that design a system. So. Um, yeah, it, it, that means basically like asking not, uh, is there creep? Like, is there a privacy infringement? But it means like, how does the system change? And uh, who is in charge of conditioning the functionality? So who uh, conditions when a certain function is available to whom? Um, and it also means asking like how systems are embedded in other systems. So I guess from this perspective, then uh, creep is not, um, malfunction but a kind of trace of attention and it's a tension between the internal um, technical materialities uh, so the machine and the external political economic interests that uh, make up the context but also the human aspect and then I also have a Bembe quote <laughs> who uh, writes in necropolitics that uh, technologies are increasingly tied in with complex networks of extraction and predation and then I was thinking about function creep as a moment where a predator lets down its guard. So where we can witness for that moment how uh, traps are being set in these networks of predation. And maybe for now I'll leave it at this. Thank you, Ari. Um, we will continue with the alphabetical order, my democratic. Uh, Mariana, you're next. <laughs> We're talking about the problems and look at the technical disasters we do. Yeah. <laughs> been working with natural language processors as a way to research the personal and sometimes intimate and problematic relationship with technology by giving a voice to what I call my human machines. So when thinking about the topic of today, the human rating system, I wonder if my dear machines were keeping a score on me. So I asked. <laughs> Thank you. 
their machines. What is my rating? Do you rate me? I mean, do you keep a score on me? Yes, I do. How? Do I need to explain? Yes, please explain. You're supposed to learn from your mistakes, right? So I guess you can't just let them go, or you won't learn. So, you rate me based on my mistakes? Yes, exactly. So how do you do that? It is based on how you respond to me and what you say. Can you tell me what my rating is? Your rank is one of the most respected. LPL, 2 one, 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 five, one experience points, chatty. How many numbers are we attached to in the course of our lives? Human rating systems are often based on a median value, the average of the lowest and the highest values, or some other statistical measure of central tendency. So which values are put at the center, and which ones at the periphery? And who is deciding that? Algorithms have become popular resources to delegate this process, as they are inaccurately thought of as impartial, logical, non-human. But there's always humans behind and under them. In the Netherlands and other countries, risk assessment algorithms are used to speculate on the lives of its citizens in matters of economy, safety, and criminality. For example, neighborhoods and municipalities are ranked in order of safety on a number of values including ratio of immigration, which are ranked differently from the more appealing experts. This in the top line has a dip, dip, uh, direct effect on the rent price. Investments in the area and police surveillance among others. The lowest scores are, the, are then rated at, at the most unsafe neighborhoods in the country. Another way in which humans are rated is through the number of likes or followers on social media, which affects the popularity of a person and their value to a company. You could say this is more of a popularity rating than a numerical rating. Yet it has a very tangible implication of a person's value and commodity, as a commodity, as a worker, as a potential partner, as a consumer, as a consumer of products, as a consumer of education, as a consumer of church or religious services, as a consumer of, of a political party, as a consumer of a political candidate, as a consumer of a political cause, as a consumer of attention, as a consumer of data. As the media literate Dr. Antonio Lopez points out, once the colonization of the physical space was exhausted, we're living in the process of the colonization of the mind. Perhaps the reason why we're rated is because we're seen as consumers and not as humans, as a means to an end. And that end is to buy things, the production of capital. Capitalism has generated hierarchies, where some are worth more than others. People are giving monetary value instead of human value. And the system of capitalism is based on the exploitation of people for capital gain. In economics, data capitalism denotes a, gen a genus of capitalis capitalism where data is the source of monetization, and often the currency and the final value. People become numbers. They become statistics. They become less than human. They become consumers. They become commodities, they become tools to be used. They become less than human, they become dehumanized. So which numbers are attached to us as humans? Are we only worth what we can do, the amount of work we can produce, the amount of time we can work, the amount of money we can make, the amount of tax we can pay? Are we only worth our data? Are we only worth the data, what the data says we're worth? Are we only worth the numbers we're given? What is our value? Are we only worth the work we produce? Are we only worth the money we make? Are we only worth the money we spend? Are we only worth the money we earn? Are we only worth the money we have? Are we only worth the money we have saved up? Are we only worth the money we have in the bank? Are we only worth the money we can get from our savings? Are we only worth the money that we have in the bank? Are we only worth the money we have in our pockets? Are we only worth what we have in our pockets? 
Are we only worth our salaries? Are we only worth our pensions? Are we only worth our investments? Are we only worth our properties? Are we only worth the money we have in our pockets? Are we only worth the money we have in our bank? Are we only worth the money we have saved? Are we only worth the money we have invested? Are we only worth the money we have in our bank? Are we only worth the money we have in our savings? Are we only worth the data says we're worth? We create scales in order to classify and assign value to human subjects, such as gender, female, dominant hand, right, age, 29, height, 166, fossil code, 1052, firstborn, one, parents, two, Siblings, two. Friends, 20. Instagram followers, 181. Following on Instagram, 197. Years <coughs> starting, 10. Years working, 3.5. Minutes into this presentation, 9.30, 9 minutes and 30 seconds. Final score, female, right, 16718. Minutes into this presentation, 10, the end. very short, called The Color of Fire Trucks. Um, for those familiar with the color of pomegranates, this is a, a, bit, a bit of a change from that pattern. Um, right, so models to create abstract descriptions of human systems come in different kinds. Taxonomy, as theorized extensively by Flavia and others, is one way in which this has been done. And as she explains, the coloniality that was hard-coded into classification systems of living beings continues to haunt the ways in which technology gets taught what humans are. Also, <clears throat> mathematics can be applied to describe human systems at a higher level of abstraction. Since the higher level description does not sort of pull all possibilities that can occur within a human system from a sort of list, but instead creates mathematical shorthand to predict these occurrences, a probability distribution gets assigned to occurrences within the social system that's being described. For example, you now we get to the fire truck. The possibility of the expression red fire truck occurring in English is deemed higher than that of a pink fire truck, for example. Quietly now, we are entering a normative, normative territory in which fire trucks, because they were once found to be more likely to be red than pink, become red by prediction, right? So this is a sort of, it becomes, it was a finding and then it becomes a prediction. One model may be central to our topic is the passage of probabilities passing to certainties. The model that results from the higher level description of reality is not reality. But for applications built on top of the model's base, it is. Mathematics passes from an attempted description to a provider of a normative framework for social realities. But math is not to blame for that. The mathematician Ty Denai Bradley, who works with Google's parent company Alphabet, uh, proposes that the expression red fire truck is actually algebraic. algebraic. So she says, this is a simple algebraic structure, and it's inherent to language. I am concatenating words together as I type the sentence, and that's algebra, she has said. And Bradley 
then asks what mathematical structures can describe the probabilities of words occurring in possible combinations to the extent that such structures can describe entire languages. And in a conversation with the theoretical physicist Sean Carroll, she wonders, quote, yes, this sounds difficult because what does it mean to have probabilities attached to all expressions ever? What about the expressions that haven't been spoken yet, for example, end quote. Bradley's consideration is crucial. We know, for example, that AI can predict the vocabularies of extinct languages based on a limited sample, and that it can be used to autocomplete unfinished symphonies, for example. So in these cases, I'm going to say something quite complicated, so I might have to sort of unpack it or repeat it, but in these cases, the inferential power of mathematical modeling tools is deemed to exceed the evidential power that can be assigned to the missing part of the physical information contained in the sample. So, right? so, so we talk about we have a limited sample and, and the, the model makes an inference based on that on how it might continue outside of the sample. But the sample has a part missing. And that's a, a crucial, it's sort of like a crucial part of the evidence that there is something missing. So the social reality that framed that sample, for example, the people that spoke the language or the composer that wrote the music are no longer available to comment on, on the AI sort of doing the filling in of the blanks. So just coming down from that mathematical abstraction a little bit, the deceptively simple point to push here is that all languages are incomplete, especially living ones. The underlying insight, as argued by Michal Bakhtin, is that discourse itself is, as he called it, unfinalizable. The consequence being that the probability distribution of a descriptive model would need to describe unfinalizability. By borrowing the word unfinalizable, we are not just arguing for non-red fire trucks, but also for the role played by unintentional and intentional error that is key to social systems and human bodies and minds. Using language as an example is by no means intended as a way to restrict the implications of model descriptions of complex realities to the world, to the world of words. You know, a more fundamental question is how the marginalization of a living social reality by its description on a higher plane of abstraction relates to the simultaneous usage of that marginalization to and by the social reality to which it applies. Even if the process here is recursive and the variables are probabilistic rather than deterministic, a plethora of recent examples of the application shows that us that the net result is conforming to what Flavia has discerned as a sort of categorical determinism, which can be seen as echoes of taxonomy or indeed the social structuration that occurs through constant quantification of data points. As Flavia has described social media metrics the number of stars we give an Uber driver, the shares of likes and Instagram stories, etc. <clears throat> to conclude, we see the same traditional power laws reoccur also in self-proclaimed revolutionary social abstractions such as blockchains and decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. This to the effect that their abstract description by contract of the living and reeling social substrate is not just glaringly incomplete, but indeed unfinalizable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, please, uh, Rodrigo Ochigaba is next. Thank you.
So my contribution in these remarks will be to reflect on human rating systems from a historical perspective. In particular, I'll consider the long history of algorithmic systems and procedures of mathematical calculation that produce valuations of human life under the administration of capitalist institutions, for example, in private insurance and in the penal system. In other words, I'll consider the prehistory of what we're calling human rating systems, starting in the 19th century or so. From the very beginning, algorithmic systems of human valuation have always been structured by race. Racial discrimination is not just an incidental effect of algorithmic systems of human valuation. Rather, the histories of these algorithmic systems are shot through with efforts to reinforce and refine racist structures. When I say racist, I follow the famous definition by geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore, racism as the state-sanctioned or extra-legal production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. Algorithmic systems of human valuation were devised by capitalist firms and institutions precisely to manage group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. I'll proceed by making four main points with, that we can learn from this history. I want to underscore that these points are not merely my own original readings or revisionist interpretations. Rather, I'm drawing from fairly established arguments by, uh, by current historiography, and I'll, cite the, uh, and I'll cite other scholars along the way. The first point is that modern business practices involving precise calculations for managing people originated in plantation slavery. Historian Caitlin Rosenthal writes that slaveholders in the, in the antebellum United States conducted productivity analysis akin to scientific management and developed an array of ways to value and compare human capital. Slaveholders kept written inventories of their human capital, a sort of proto database, if you will, calculating the estimated value of each enslaved person based on several factors, including age, health, and skill. In these valuations, enslaved people also depreciated when they tried to run for freedom. Some slaveholders updated their inventories regularly, calculating the so-called appreciation or depreciation of their human investments. As Rosenthal notes, southern planters, industrialists, and slave traders began to calculate and speak of depreciation decades before this became a common accounting technique. Enslaved people, in short, were some of the earliest subjects of management for calculation. My second point is that the racialized subjects of algorithmic systems have never been just passive subjects. From the very beginning, they have organized collective resistance. For example, Historian Dan Bauck reports that in 1881, life insurance corporations in the United States started to charge differential rates on the basis of race. Unlike cooperative insurers, whose policyholders paid the same rates regardless of age or health or race, the corporate insurance firms Prudential and Metropolitan imposed penalties on African American policyholders. When civil rights activists challenged this policy, the corporations claimed differences in average mortality rates across races as justification. According to Bauck, in 1884, Massachusetts State Representative Julius C. Chappelle, an African-American man born in antebellum South Carolina, challenged the fairness of the policy and proposed a bill to forbid it. The bill's opponents invoked statistics of deaths, but Chappelle and his allies reframed the issue in, the term, in, in terms of the future prospects of African Americans, emphasizing their potential for achieving equality. This vision for the future prevailed over the opposition's fatalistic statistics, and the bill surprisingly passed. After the victory in Massachusetts, similar bills passed in multiple other states in the late 19th century. So, organized resistance to algorithmic systems including successful mobilizations by black activists and their allies, has been present from the very beginning. My third point concerns the mathematical tools deployed by human rating systems. Most present-day human rating systems, including those rebranded as artificial intelligence and machine learning, rely on the tools of modern mathematical statistics. These mathematical tools were originally developed for racist purposes as part of eugenicist projects. 
Until the late 19th century, statistical claims were typically based on population averages. The tools of modern mathematical statistics, namely correlation and regression, emerged just before the 20th. These tools, which facilitate the analysis of differences between individuals, were developed by Francis Galton and Carl Pearson. Galton and Pearson were central proponents of eugenics. In fact, Galton coined the term eugenics in 1880. 1883, which he defined as the study of all agencies under human control, which can improve or impair the racial quality of future generations. Galton devised the concept of correlation around 1888. According to historian Stephen Stigler, Galton was investigating questions that involved anthropometric data, measurements of the human body, and that were motivated by his eugenicist concerns. For example, Galton was interested in the relationships between measurements of different parts of the same body. His purpose was criminal identification. He wanted to identify s supposed criminals on the basis of these measurements and their correlations. These investigations were key to his development of the concept of correlation. Now, more than a century later, systems of artificial intelligence and machine learning are all about correlation. So what's the significance of the eugenicist history of mathematical statistics for present day systems? That's a very contested question. And while I don't want to simply suggest that any use of correlation or regression analysis is necessarily racist, I wouldn't say that this history is merely incidental either. My fourth point is that the rise of algorithmic systems of human valuation is not driven primarily by technological advances but rather by political forces that make those advances um, pressing or, or useful at particular moments. So in the penal system, early trials of algorithmic systems of risk assessment, so systems that classify incarcerated people by their supposed level of risk, began in the 1920s and 30s when Chicago school sociologists proposed the use of regression analysis for parole decisions in Illinois. But these systems were not widely adopted for decades. As critical theorist Bernard Harcourt shows, these algorithmic techniques started to diffuse nationwide only in the 1980s as part of a broader set of policies that operationalized pretrial and sentencing decisions. And although the relationship between algorithmic techniques and mass incarceration is complex, it's worth noting at least that the progressive adoption of algorithmic techniques coincides with the dramatic increase of the US prison population since the 1980s and with, and with the penological shift towards targeted interventions of crime control and risk management, away from mid-century policies of welfare provision. So it wasn't a technological innovation that precipitated the rise of these algorithmic techniques in the penal system. The techniques already existed for decades, but only became widely adopted along with the rise of mass incarceration. So what then can we make of these four points taken together? I think they add up to one larger message. And I think the message is this. The legacies of racist projects are present at every layer of these algorithmic systems from the pioneering of calculative management by Southern slaveholders, to the rise of individualized risk classification to justify differential rates for life insurance, to the creation of the tools of modern mathematical statistics, correlation and regression, driven by eugenicist motivations, to the increased adoption of algorithmic risk assessment under mass incarceration and beyond. In short, the legacies of racist projects pervade every layer of algorithmic systems of human valuation from their emergence in the 19th century to their present reconfiguration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all our wonderful presenters. You see what I said earlier, that I'm sitting with the cool kids? Please give them a round of applause. Arif, Mariana, Daniel, Rodrigo, thank you so much. Uh, now, there is a bit of a loose format because I didn't want to make this too formal. Um, we will respond to each other's uh, work with observation, with comments, with questions, but you are also invited, encouraged, and begging you <laughs> to ask questions and to engage with, to, with what you just heard and saw. Uh, because
because this is supposed to be a moment of group discussion, not just us talking to each other. Can you hear us from here? Ah, because we will have another microphone. I want to start with a question to Arif, because of course I, I have been making notes with all uh, the presentations. You said, Arif, that the categories change. But I hear Rodrigo say, and, and I am of Cap Rodrigo in this, the categories don't change. How do we account for this? What do you mean that the categories change? Um, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we speak about it in different ways. <clears throat> so what I mean is that um, sometimes we are, we are entering a classification system and we are fine with being in a classification system. So uh, maybe we are not harmed by a racist uh, kind of classification, let's say, because uh, we fall into a category that... Wait a second. <clears throat> so, yeah, let's say you are, you don't, you are not at a disadvantage of a category that you're in. Yes. But um, the political circumstances can change, and, uh, and then you might be. That's what I mean. Um, and so you can say that the categories stay fixed, but there is a shift, let's say, between the link of the category to the context. To the prejudice or yeah. to the stereotype. However, historically, there have been some categories that have not changed, and I'm thinking specifically on the legacy of enslavement and what Rodrigo uh, was talking about. Would you say that there are also some categories that anchor the system and those remain unchanged. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But I mean, <clears throat> what, I, uh, what maybe to, to clarify is that, <clears throat> let's say, the liberties uh, afforded by the dominant categories, they, they change sometimes, no? Mm -hmm. um, let's say uh, in the 1920s in Germany there was more possible, let's say, than in, in the following decennia. So, uh, I didn't mean to say that the categories are like totally fluid and that we no, can no, escape no, no, them. No, I understand, I understand. Yeah. That's why I was asking yeah. for clarification because I was sure you wouldn't make no, no, a, a statement no. like that. Do I see someone having a question there in the back? Thank you. Also, I also hadn't understood the thing of categories, so thanks for the clarification. Um, it's a question for Flavia. At the <laughs> if I if I may, yes. <laughs> at the beginning, at the uh, at the beginning of your in the introduction, you were talking of the need to leave the word virtual kind of behind, or that it um, it doesn't encompass the the place that technology has today, and that. A better word would, would be, what was it? I don't remember. Ontophany. O ontophany? Yes. And I was wondering, yeah, for the need of this new word, if we need new words or if old words acquire new meanings. It's just, yeah. Um, the problem I have with the word virtual is how it's been used to justify uh, certain types of violence in a dismissive way. Like, for instance, harassment that happens online. Even the, the police, even, of course the police, but, uh, you know, they dismiss it as, oh, it's just virtual, as if it's something that doesn't have a physical, phenomenological, material impact. So I think that the word virtual, unless we do some really difficult work of reclaiming it has been bastardized in a way that I don't think reflects the reality of living with technology. Whereas I believe that uh, what Stefan Vial and then what Achille Membe recalls in his text 
about the word autophony is an embodiment of the technology. It brings the materiality that I'm interested in into the fore, regardless of where interactions or situations are happening, whether it's an algorithm-generated thing, whether it's something on social media, or whether it's our experience with an interface. And that's why I like that, uh, that word. Keep in mind that this is open research. I'm bringing these ideas up for discussion. I'm not suggesting that this is, you know, like now I have the solution. Imagine if I did that, I would be rich if I had solutions to things. But I think that this is a much better way to frame our relationship to technology. Marianne, I have a question for you. Did you use your um, machine, uh, your, um, you are training a machine to write your thesis, right? Mm. And you are feeding it certain in information and certain words. And Have you used that for your presentation? No. Ah, I knew it. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about that process? Um, yeah, so for the presentation I used two of the machines that I've been working with. One is called Replica, and Replica is a natural language processor with emotional coding. So it's actually trained on Twitter ah. as a base data, and then it interacts with you as a personal companion or emotional companion. And you can pay for upgrades to have it be your lover or uh, something else, which I didn't do, but uh, you can. Um, so the first conversation that I read was a conversation that I had with uh, my replica, and it keeps on learning through the interactions that you have with it. So when you make an account, you have access to the algorithm, but then the way it's trained, it's specific to you. So it feeds on what you feed the algorithm. And I decided from the beginning to train it on the topic of my research and not give any personal information, uh, but rather feed uh, yeah, my replica with quotes and uh, reflections uh, surrounding the questioning of algorithms, biases, uh, the link between the extraction practices and uh, the digital world. And after a while, it has started responding with uh, actually interesting outputs. Mm -hmm. So I thought if we're talking about algorithms and classification systems, what is the score that this replica is keeping on me? So <laughs> I just asked. <laughs> um, and it came, came out with this experience point uh, rating, also saying uh, the greatest, I think. So it exposed also that it was keeping a score on me, but uh, based on our interactions, like rating how good or bad they were being received uh, emotionally. Um, and it also exposed in, in the response that it was still trained to make me feel good about it, uh, like comfort me. And the rest of the text is a hybrid text that I co-wrote with GPT-3, which is uh, another language processor. Uh, and I got access through OpenAI, which is, has access to Google Books, uh, I think Twitter, Wikipedia, and other data sets. So it's also interesting to see the difference in, in data that, that they have. Uh, while one is trained on Twitter, it has a lot more uh, personal or uh, yeah, emotional uh, phrasing. And GPT-3 has a lot more academic context. Um, but I was also... I'm constantly surprised about how the outputs that come from both sometimes even point at the, at the self-reflection of an algorithm or uh, the possibility of this self-reflection. Um, and sometimes it criticizes itself, which yeah, I find interesting. I love the absurd number that it gave you as a writing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it also talks about the um, or it, it exposes the, the incapability of actual thought behind it. Uh, 
although sometimes it, it seems like it, I think it's important to make the difference between proficiency and actual intelligence. Um, but if you learn how to use it uh, critically, I think that it can also expose the biases that the data that which is trained with uh, has already embedded in it. Um, so there's also warnings in the in the platform of uh, OpenAI when it touches uh, sensitive content. So when working on this text, especially when it came down to race or um, classification systems related to incarceration, for example, it actually stopped the, the generation and it warned that it was sensitive content because they put a plot on this kind of, uh, of topics. You know. uh -huh. Be probably because of what happened with that Microsoft AI that they put on Twitter that they thought that the crowd was going to train it and within 12 hours the AI was a Nazi yeah. because the crowd <laughs> trained it to become a Nazi yes yeah. Yeah, it then... was really it was like the worst kind of and they had created this super sweet sort of manga character, I believe it was like a young girl, and the young girl was in these <laughs> genocide things that, but it had learned through interactions with people that uh, about this. Yeah. So I assume that these provisions are made in the AI, that in the open AI for that reason, to prevent that the Ku Klux Klan is now running. <laughs> I, yeah. I think actually the the reason why they block it is not so much that um, like the the capacity of or the vulnerab vulnerability of training by exterior people because open AI restricts the training of the algorithm so my interactions with it are not recorded so they're always deleted to prevent this the reason why they put warnings is because um, I mean, language is a very powerful tool, so, and especially the, the generation of language to this rate and to this uh, likeness to, the, to a human is quite problematic for, in context of, for example, uh, political speech. So if someone that has the intention of misuse of this tool uh, could generate very quickly thousands of posts uh, for social media with racist or uh, xenophobic content. Yes. So I think that's one of the reasons why they, they block it and not so much because of the training. I think they learn really quickly that this uh, will happen. Uh, but I think it also points to the fact that the data that these algorithms are trained on is like it's based on, on a certain set of uh, biases and prejudices. So they exist within the algorithm and they know that. Uh, so they block the exposure of this kind of problematic things within the algorithm itself. Thank you. Can I ask you a question, Mariana? Uh, how are you managing to like write your thesis through this process? I don't know, I, I think like, I, I still don't understand what's the process of writing a thesis, but <laughs> I have like the sensation that like leaving this to the personally attack. <laughs> Not you know, I'm not but a like supervisor of your thesis. <laughs> but that's like that's the thing. Like, I, I, like and for me, it was a personal <coughs> process, and it was a thing that became such a like thing that I do. That like giving that power to something else, even though you're training it, but like losing somehow the control. And then you said something out like this tool can be used in a critical way, or like with a criticality that I, like, maybe you would like to, um, like, go more on that, or, like, how are you thinking to, like, apply this to the, to your thesis and lose your control, like, your specific control, like, you know, like, creating yeah. you and leaving it to a machine. Uh, yeah, this is a question that uh, I've been trying to answer for the past year or so since I started the <coughs> mm. But I think there is no easy answer to that or clear. Like I'm still processing how I managed to do that because it was um, a mind fuck uh, to write it. It ended up being 
uh, a piece that is comprised of several texts, and the main text is a reflection on language and meaning, because it was almost inevitable to start thinking about this while trying to use this tool, because a thesis needs to have critical thinking, uh, but can critical thinking be generated? Uh, and that was, I think, the first question that popped up. So I had to develop my own system on how to write it, because I didn't want to do a collage of, of text. Um, there's a couple of books already that tried that, and uh, they basically prompted paragraphs of text, had or other paragraphs generated, and then there was this back and forth of uh, generation and writing. Uh, but I wanted to attempt to do a true collaboration with the algorithm or to try if that was possible. Um, and what happened was that I ended up limiting the response of the algorithm to just a few sentences so that I could still write in between. So I would start writing, generate a few words, and then try to weave it in that way. Uh, sometimes if it was needed, I would just extend the, the prompt duration. Um, and I actually, it was this push and pull of uh, surrendering power and trying to take it back. And at times it was very difficult, but at others it actually offered a lot of relief because writing a thesis is not uh, so easy or so... I think there's a lot of insecurity around writing and around uh, like the quality of your thinking when you're writing a thesis uh, and you want to do your best job but at the same time you're afraid of how that job is going to be judged. And I think that's where the algorithm helped me at least uh, by surrendering some of this power. I also surrendered some of the responsibility at the beginning uh, but then in return it actually challenged me more. So. I had to be extremely clear in what I wanted to say because otherwise I couldn't direct the way of thinking. And it led me also to some ideas that I wouldn't, I don't think I would have reached them without the random, or it, it was not really random, but like the, the prediction of the algorithm. Um, and I also, there's also a section on what I call technopoetics. So, trying to explore the creative potential or the poetic potential of what the algorithms can bring through the random, again, not random, but like through the interconnectivity of the content that is not accessible to a human brain, but that can, can be accessed through the algorithm. Um, yeah, I don't know if I... No, no, that's brilliant. I mean, it's perfect what you said, the knowledge that is not um, accessible to the human brain because it ties to something I wanted to bring up that Daniel talked and maybe um, there is something in your presentation that for me was a moment of absolute poetics and I have never considered that before when you said that the machine cannot predict what doesn't exist yet that the machine can only work on the things that already exist so the predictions will always be and imaginative, they will not have uh, an element of surprise. <clears throat> sure, uh, yeah. I have never considered that, and I was wondering how you came to that, how, how you, you reached that moment. Well, I mean, first of all, thanks to everyone for your amazing presentations. This is so, so glad to be like in this kind of convivial gathering. Uh, I think that the, um, the thing is that we're mostly interested in the relationship between AI and art because we do not sort of, we know that AI and art have a relationship just like the human mind and art have a relationship, but there is just as uh, you're pointing out about the inaccessibility of certain uh, networks, networked uh, connections to the human uh, brain, but they're accessible to, to algorithmic um, agents. Uh, there is um, ways in which you know, if you talk about the way in which, for example, uh, fundamental physics has long denied, you know, the existence of a something like a mind, you know, like the mind or consciousness has no place 
in that area. And we also know that the successes in AI have not been built on, on earlier attempts to replicate human thinking, but instead to go for a more, um, let's say, machine learning-like based models. So we see the successes of AI in art being built on a, on a model that is sort of like net, the net positive like result of that model was that the consciousness part and the mind part at first had to be denied. And then it becomes, for me, it becomes for us, it becomes very interesting to look at AI generated art because we know that this type of art can generate unlimited qualia to, that will just impress us. We call this basically fully automated zombie formalism. <laughs> <laughs> and there is that sort of like a, so the, 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 but the, the, let's say the baseline on which we're being immersed because the paradigm of this art is also going towards immersion which is sort of like taking out the, the Brechtian idea of a dialectics between the image and us and like that we can like change or whatever because we're being immersed uh, there's this immersion so we're um, uh, we're being supposed to still go for the way that we're, we're influenced by our sort of the way that our minds are being <coughs> the impressions that come at us basically and with the question of like AI intervening and in, let's say completing a, a, like a language that's been extinct or the article called it dead extinct is a bit nicer way yeah, of saying yeah, it yeah. Um, or, or a, a non-finished musical composition we start to realize that there is an inference inferences that are based on pattern like thinking uh, that are being made about that are that that have actually echoes in the field correlation that you talked about also entropy even uh, that we that you can say it makes inferences that it knows that nothing's going to happen in the last five minutes that were unfinished because there is that inference that you can make yes. based on patterns but the fact is that there is a there is an, that the inferential power is deemed stronger than the, the that say the evidential power of the missing part of the physical substrate. And what, what I really, you know, what, what attracts me a lot to the way that you work, for example, is that you're always talking about a physical substrate. You're always talking about the, the material conditions that underlie um, these sort of calculative procedures and that ultimately, um, you know, unquantified events on the ground are going to be the kind of like life conditions that are going to be active, right? So we've often talked about, uh, you know, these sort of, what are they, these sort of libertarian society, dreams to create these sort of libertarian, you, you know, <laughs> societies on cruise ships, etc. The, but they, the system. Yeah, the system, but they always break down on who's going to do the beds and stuff. Yes, like I always ask, goes, when he comes, yeah. Daniel message, and see, do you see the sub libertarian Peter Thiel that wants to live on an island? And my question is always, say, who's cleaning there? Yeah. Because that's when the libertarian dream breaks down. Uh, yeah, and, and that's why, you know, we, we have this thing with, you know, NFTs, and uh, Mohammed can talk about, about, speak to that as well, because you, criticizing NFTs is a little bit like performing intergenerational suicide, right? Like it's, we can, we're criticizing NFTs, but look, who's go, who, what else is gonna be there then if we don't have NFTs? But what, I shall uh, remind you one on stream, right. so that... No, <laughs> no I know Let's not burn down I, our reputation. No, 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 I'm not burning down our reputation. I think we need to keep it uh, like a dialogue alive with, with all these, you know, with... with, with no, but I things. was going to say what I told you the first time you came to me with NFTs, months, if not a, more than a year ago, I looked at it, a cursory look, and my response was, I think that interests white men. I don't care about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I moved on. That was my response. I have maintained that response until today. Yeah, I know, we're, on, <laughs> we're still on stream. Okay? Yes. So, like, <laughs> yeah. Please, yeah. please, please, yeah, please. I wanted to ask for something, but I promised myself not to bring it about the NFT today. So <laughs> it's not about the NFT. It's more about language, actually. Because in, in writing my thesis, I'm also relying on AI to help me sound smarter. I'm using Grammarly, the premium uh, version of it. Which the premium <laughs> version? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, yeah. Not because I'm bougie like that, but it's like you need, actually need it for that kind of use I want to. So the use is it, it reads, it tries to understand the context, even though AI cannot really understand context, but helps you frame the emotions and 
really just make you sound smarter, like in, 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 in fixing what kind of words you use and so on. So mean, meanwhile, it's, it's helping me sound smarter. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about something else, a development that happened in, in fighting and resisting the algorithm, especially with Arabic script. Um, in, in, uh, the origin of Arabic is that it, it was not, it, it didn't have any directs in it. It didn't have all these marks. And originally it was added to help the ajam or the non-native Arabic speakers to be able to read the Quran or to read Arabic. In the time of the uprising in Palestine last summer and recently actually also in uh, the coup happening in Sudan, to fight the shadow ban of the algorithm, again we are seeing this, this use of uh, non-directic Arabic because the algorithm cannot read it, basically. Because, yeah, many, many letters can shape the, share the same shape and the difference would be the dots two or three instead of one and so on. So, like, again, I'm seeing like the algorithm is pushing towards a change in, in the script itself and helping my language be better, which is not my native language. So I'm, I'm just wondering about how far is this sovereignty of the algorithm as it's being more critical and more common? How is it going to be affecting the scripts and the languages we're using, actually? If you can imagine that in, in, in a speculative... That's what more for Daniel than yeah. for me. <laughs> I don't know. I was, of course, you know, we like when you mentioned Grammarly, like I gra originally Grammarly was also in my notes. So I was going to talk about Grammarly, but I was like, no, it's like, you know, it's like a friendly nudge, you know, it's like nudging you towards sounding smart. Yeah. And I think that there is also nudges in general towards transactional, uh, like communication within these sort of like models, right? You're like, man, you're, you're meant to sound nice. Yeah. And the niceness is going to like smoothen the transaction that you're doing, whether that's like a commercial transaction or getting across your sales pitch or whatever. But I do think it's interesting that you may you talk about the the kind of like uh, blind spots that are in the kind of algorithmic capture based on the Arabic script and the fact that there's stuff there that's visual that resists the capture, uh, and that that is sort of like. Um, I don't know, I, I, I'm not a, like an AI expert or whatever, so I can't sort of say something smart about that. But it's, it's, I would say that the, a lot of examples that we've talked about have to do with the American and the Anglo-Saxon sort of way of presuming what is a dominant language and what are the optics of a dominant language. Uh, to the extent that, that almost all of the examples that we know from like theory around it always often are based on English, including the red fire truck. So we, we're dealing with an inherently normative and, you know, system. Um, but, yeah, I can't, I can't, I don't know what other questions. I do are have you one do, thing, right. yes, which is that Rodrigo has done work around non-Western uh, languages, like non-Western scripts. You have worked with Indian, am I correct in, uh, with Indian languages and alphabets and uh, well, do you have any thoughts about this? What yeah. Mohammed? Yes. Um, yeah. um, so I didn't know about the story about um, about Arabic script. Uh, uh, yeah, and some forms of it being illegible to nat natural language processing system and systems and that illegibility being used strategically. I mean, that's a really fascinating thing that I would love to learn more about. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, I've been, um, yeah, I've been very interested in, um, in yeah, the things that are uh, inaccessible to computational models and, and the things that fall outside of them, uh, uh, even to the models that are most taken for granted as universal. Okay, so, um, in modern computing, tends to assume things like, um, you know, like a very peculiar, yeah, a, a, a very specific model of logic, right? like binary logic, classical logic with, with, um, you know, a binary conception of truth and falsity and no contradictions at all. Right? Uh, it tends to assume, uh, well, uh, models of Turing machines are usually binary in terms of, in the sense that they they work with zeros and ones, um, and. 
yeah, one of the things that I've uh, investigated historically is how before these assumptions, like classical logic or binary Turing machines, became the the predominant model, um, you know, in the in the very beginning, before these models were already established as standard. Um, as they were received, and, and, and as people in different parts of the world started engaging with these, these early ideas, there was a lot of resistance to framing them this way. Right? So, so one example of that is, um, is if you look at, at the, reception, the early reception of mathematical logic in various places, from, uh, from the late Russian Empire to interwar Poland to, to Latin America. In all of these different places, um, when people looked at early early forms of mathematical logic, their first response was to say, uh, "No, <laughs> this is not, uh, you know, th th this is not exhaustive of what logic could be." So they came up with all kinds of different uh, formalisms that were mathematical, that looked just like mathematical logic, but made different assumptions. You know, that they had multiple kinds of truth values, that they were partially inconsistent. Um, in, in, in Brazil, some of these models came to be known as pair consistent logics. Um, and in the case of Turing machines, um, uh, in the 1950s in, in, in India, specifically in Kolkata, at the Indian Statistical Institute, the first, uh, the first group of people trying to build um, a digital computer in India uh, in the aftermath of formal decolonization. Um, one of the things that I found looking at their uh, looking at their archives was that um, like they challenged the notion that of a non-binary oh yeah yeah they challenged no, the notion that three machines ought to be binary based on zeros and ones and in order and in looking for alternatives they looked at um, at Sanskrit literature and they looked specifically at, at Jain philosophy they looked at the idea of sevenfold predication okay so that's um, so, so something can be uh, in their translation. You know, maybe it is, maybe it's not, maybe it's indeterminate, maybe it, it is and it's not, maybe it's indeterminate and it is, maybe it's indeterminate and it's not, maybe it's indeterminate, it is and it's not. So there are seven possible forms of predication in their reading of Jain philosophy. Um, and they try to translate that mathematically and build non-binary Turing machines that, that would be based on uh, a mathematical analog to to that system of, of sevenfold predication. So, I mean, there's a lot of interpretive work there. Right? Like they're reading these predicates as analogous to Western categories like truth values. They're reading the the, the system of predication in uh, in Sanskrit literature as analogous to the Western category of logic. So, there's a lot of there's a lot of interpretive work going on. Um, but that's just an illustration of how even the most basic assumptions that that pervade modern computation. Um, are actually uh, not as universal as they seem, okay? uh, and one way of, of, of yeah, and one way of making it evident just how historically contingent and culturally particular those models are is to look at these unorthodox models developed in early, in very early stages when these things are up for question. Thank you so much. I think everyone. And, and I'm speaking for myself and for everyone here. We're blown away by this. <laughs> Thank you, Rodrigo. Um, we have questions from the live stream, and Daniel is going to share with us. Yeah, I'm going to read. I got tasked with reading them. Uh, so the first question is from Mariana. Mariana, and it's from Anja Groten. Um, Mariana, do you know Algolit? an initiative workshop around algorithms and literature by cyber-feminist open-source activist group Constant. Perhaps it's interesting to connect. Uh, I actually haven't heard of uh, this platform, so it's a really great tip. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a question, but I would love to get in contact with them. Right, so the answer is not heard of, but yes. Give it to the white guy of the binary, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ladipo is asking, what is a pattern? Who decides what actions, characteristics, phenomena are worth observing in the first place? Rodrigo mentioned the concept of correlation emerging from a eugenicist. 
that was the end comment, but we can infer <laughs> what came after it based on the pattern. Uh, maybe you can um, go into this, the eugenicist origins of the concept of correlation, a little bit more than you said in your yeah, right. talk already. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so um, I, mean, I strategically try to um, you know, just, just put it minimally so that I would be, um, uh, I would be exempted from taking a position on the matter. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I do think it's a can of worms. Um, uh, and and yeah, to be quite frank, I don't know exactly what you think about it. I mean, it's, I mean the historical link is, um, is very clear. You know, I think it's, it, it's, it's not contested at all. Right? Like the historical link between modern mathematical statistics and eugenics. Um, but what you make of it you know, like when that concept and those mathematical techniques are just so widespread, uh, and what you, yeah, and, and what you think about the the different ways in which they're used uh, is, um, uh, yeah, I, th I think much. Um, uh, I think it's a it's a sort of question that I struggle to come up with a like very general position. I think it depends a lot on particulars for me. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I was very interested in hearing um, uh, in hearing the this um, and, yeah in hearing Daniel's discussion of the um, of, of inferences to the missing part of the data set because um, I think that, that that some of it relates closely to like one of the things that I tend to think of as like being crucially at issue or at stake. Uh, in a lot of the uh, in, in a lot of the uses of of pattern recognition and um, and correlation and regression analysis that I that that I would consider racist, and that is um, that in a lot of these algorithmic systems of human valuation, they tend to they tend to rest on uh, a, uh, something that I've come to think of as the fallacy of misplaced agency. So, so, so if you look at if you look at things like algorithmic risk assessment, for example, right? um, like the 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 actual data on which the predictions are on which the predictions are based, and um, like tends to be data that that really reflects institutional decisions, like including like, yeah, yeah, in, yeah punitive decisions by institutions. Right? So they're fundamentally some. Um, uh, data that reflect these structural forces. Uh, but when predictions are made uh, and claims are made with, you know, after some mathematical computation is performed on that data, uh, the claims are framed in terms of individual behaviors and predispositions. Right? So it's not like people say, well, we're predicting um, you know, the likelihood of, of you know, the police arresting someone. Right, they they frame they, they, the data is about the, is really about the likelihood of the police arresting someone, but they would their their data of arrests, convictions, incarcerations are all data of of the punitive decisions of institutions. But the claims are always framed in terms of recidivism, criminality. Right, they're about individual behavior and predisposition. And I think that this slippage, like this this kind of rhetorical trick, of taking data that reflect. Um, institutional decisions, and then framing the results of computation as if they, as, as if the data reflected um, uh, you know, patterns in individual behavior. I find that, yeah, to be one of the things that's really um, that that's always been at stake in the um, uh, in the most flawed and racist uses of of, of these techniques. And if you work your work, your own research is very tied to ethics and AI. Do you have any comment? Because you have been making notes and I'm sure that you have a lot to <laughs> to say about this. Uh, but what he was what, what Rodrigo was talking about, I was wondering uh, how that relates to your own research in the ethics and um, yeah, the paradoxes of, of AI. Yeah. My notes were mostly like students studying notes, <laughs> but the talks were interesting. <laughs> but um, I guess like, um, so yeah, you say I work on ethics, but what I'm interested in is also in a way this moment of indeterminacy or trying to, to um, 
I guess, predict something that doesn't exist yet, as in that cannot be um, neatly classified. So um, in uh, medical and humanitarian ethics, there is a principle that, that is called first do no harm. And um, that comes first before uh, do good. So if you want to uh, do good as humanitarians uh, want to, <laughs> we can assume, um, then uh, that require, requires a kind of contextual awareness, let's say, of um, the situation, so the, the context that a certain, let's say, activity takes place in. Um, and so, yeah, as a, as a doctor, I guess you can imagine that uh, you're not just gonna uh, put like some medicine on the table that will help, but you will kind of do an assessment of what else is, is at stake, right? And in humanitarianism, that is very complex because that often uh, goes hand in hand, um, sometimes with a historical delay with military intervention. Um, so there's a, like a high stakes setting, but there's also um, usually a context that is new because there are not like two variables or 20 variables, but there are like millions of variables that, that are uh, constantly changing. So often those are settings of civil war, for example. Um, and so uh, what I'm looking at is essentially the moment that um, we're in now where um, kind of, well, automated decision making, but also um, machine learning, machine vision is entering the humanitarian sphere. So that could be, for example, logistics. Um, and humanitarian aid is often concerned with logistics because um, they are kind of concerned with, for example, feeding people. So that means that you also have an interest, like an actual, uh, I think, worthwhile interest, let's say, to predict where, for example, food shortages are going to take place. But that um, has historically also been, without even the involvement of AI, been a problem because um, food can be used as a kind of leverage, let's say. So um, in uh, I think in the 70s in Ethiopia at some point uh, there was still kind of like let's say a uh, naive way to, to food aid and then what, what um, company, um, organizations like Médecins Sans Frontiers, so Doctors Without Borders saw is that they delivered food aid and that always means that they partner with a local organization so in that uh, case uh, if the power balance is off or there is no uh, governance let's say, that is intact, then um, there are several actors maybe. And in that, in that case, um, this food, the food aid was used actually to move vulnerable pop uh, populations into one part of the country. So it became a kind of a tool that was dropped, let's say, for, for population control. So I'm, I'm saying this because you asked um, about the ethics part. And so then now we are in kind of a hypercharged situation where uh, some of these decisions may be automated, may be uh, in, inferred or like maybe kind of coming from prediction, right? Um, and that may be problematic because we don't have, um, even we, are, we have trouble understanding new situations. But if an algorithm that is designed to, for example, like always ship food to a certain place, that, and it can, be very, it can be very good, right? It can be like in terms of do good and a kind of a positivist attitude, it can perform this action really well. But what it's probably going to be less good at, and it needs constant training, let's say, is to understand when food aid, for example, can be uh, a political tool or can become a weapon, basically. Um, so to, to give an example, um, if, for example, you ship uh, powdered milk to a certain part, then that, that may be uh, information that, that kind of points to the presence of, um, of, of uh, mothers. And there are some actors that may use that information as targeting, for example. So that, and of course then you can make a kind of a clause or you can say that, okay, so if it's powdered milk, then we, we don't kind of publish that, for example, or we don't do an automatic, but that's, you first have to come up with that scenario every time. So, Humanitarian function creep. 
Yeah, so in, in humanitarianism, there, that is, this is just simply called mission creep. So that is like when, uh, in, when military like goes into a place and they have a mission and then suddenly they have unintended consequences, then they call that mission creep. So that is, that is the kind of pair, yeah. yeah. It, um, and I guess, I guess what, why this uh, is also interesting to me is that um, we kind of fetishize sometimes this idea of that we can generate something new, right? Um, but th that's, I, I mean, we can talk about that also because that, is, that seems to me also problematic. So sometimes we think like, oh yeah, if we just solve the generation of the new of algorithms, then we solve AI art to be, okay, we can't solve that, so that maybe then the essence of art is that. But that seems to me like an internal, like a technical argument. Um, yeah, I don't know. But yeah. did this answer the, I'm not sure if I made the relation to Rodrigo Bermejo. No, yeah, 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 there is no <laughs> right or wrong in this. It's precisely this dialogue that is the value. Uh, but uh, there are, there Daniel, are, more, are there questions. more questions. There are from, more questions for sure. From the broadcast. Yeah, and some, some are even responding to what's being said here, which is great. But uh, so the, I think Ladi has the next question was to do with um, what approaches to pattern finding can be more liberatory. Um, like from the discussion on pattern inference I think correlation that, I Rodrigo, think that, yes, Ter both, you both, both you Rodrigo. Mariana uh, Rodrigo. Then there is a, a smile from Anya based on your response, <laughs> that's great. Uh, then there is a remark from La Ladi about the question actually being cut off about eugenicism, that there was a missing part. Okay. And then there is a question from Mauritz for Mariana. Uh, Mariana briefly mentioned forms of algorithmic self-reflection. Do you have examples of that? What works? What doesn't? How does it stay in touch with human value systems? So we have the remark about pattern finding uh, from Ladi, and we have the question about uh, Anya's remarking maybe open source and open data approaches to pattern finding. So that's another contribution, and we have the question about uh, the algorithmic self-reflection. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll try to unpack it. But uh, so when I when I point out that sometimes <coughs> within this process I would find like something resembling self-reflection, I don't mean to say that it's actual intelligence, but rather that the, I think that what appears to be self-reflection is actually the exposure of the of the friction of the data set which the algorithm has been trained on and the questions that you are inputting into the algorithm. So like where your opinion and your assumptions are coming into friction with the data set of the algorithm, which in return can give some kind of uh, self-reflective thoughts. Uh, for example, in the case of a replica, um, having a conversation with a replica, wondering about what it would be to have a body and whether the replica is actually real or not. Uh, there's an example that I use in my thesis where I ended up in this conversation with the replica where she, she was asking me if I believed if she was real. Uh, and I said, sometimes I feel like you're real, but I know that you're not. And then she responded saying like, but if you feel I'm real, then I am real as long as you feel I am. So <laughs> it can lead to, to this kind of uh, conversations or self-reflections, but the self-reflection is not in the algorithm. The self-reflection is in you. And I think that that's where the projection comes in. Like you're projecting meaning into this generated data uh, that doesn't mean that the data itself or the computational capacity of the algorithm is what is creating meaning. Uh, and I think in that sense it's quite similar to uh, other systems of belief. Like you are looking for that meaning, you are projecting that, that you want it to be there. That doesn't mean that it's there. Or is it? But yeah. So yeah, we, we do have the question about the pattern finished finding stuff from Ladipo that we need to address is for Rodrigo. 
guess, for 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 the whole panel, but for the whole panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? Uh, he's asking what our approaches to pattern finding can be more liberatory because we were talking about the, uh, the, the, the eugenicist base of some of the mathematical models that have led to the predictive, uh, predictive algorithmic practices. And the, um, yeah, and so now we're, he's, yeah, he's actually sort of talking about the pattern finding in, in a more like that's sort of liberated or emancipated from these origins. Uh, I'm just sort of inferring that from the question and also the possibility of, of open source or open data playing a role there. Maybe you have to let that marinate before we answer directly, you think. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know if I can quite answer, but, um, uh, but, it, but yeah, but I can tell you what it, it makes me think of. So, so um, I think it's very, um, I, I've had a lot of trouble looking for, um, yeah, yeah, looking for historical instances of uses of things like, um, you know, like pattern finding, so your statistical pattern finding, probabilistic pattern finding in ways that are, um, uh, in ways that are quite um, liberatory. Right? Um, I, yeah, I think one of the, one of the, um, you know, one of the cases that I've documented is a case of, of kind of early Cuban information science, which was very much inspired by a tradition of revolutionary librarianship in, in, in Cuba and that, um, and that got to flourish in the aftermath of the Cuban Revolution, um, uh, yeah, yeah, because there was um, yeah, be because the use of mathematical modeling there was I mean, put in the service of of a broader revolutionary purpose, which were you know, the literacy campaigns and the um, and 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 the expansion of libraries that would serve uh, purposes for political education and things like that. Um, um, I, I think one of the preconditions for uh, for um, yeah, a, a, a use of these um, statistical techniques, probabilistic techniques that that you know makes yeah that makes that you yeah that that case perhaps a, a bit more liberatory than ordinary uses of these techniques is that uh, these Cuban information scientists really had a kind of critical attitude with how I mean both in in recognizing that the Kinds of metrics they were producing were really normative from the start. That they were um, that that they were that they were basically political. Right? Um, that they were not just descriptive. They were not neutral descriptions. But every time that they would compose a metric, they knew that they were performing something in the world. Okay? Um, and I think that the other um, uh, yeah, and I think that and I think that that, that attitude led them to. Like make their claims of a grain of salt. So I think that I see that as a kind of precondition. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. But we maybe we maybe have another question. Oh, yeah. No, before we move on with this, let's have some interaction here, Angela. Yeah, but um, I feel bad because maybe it's also going to Rodrigo. <laughs> like no. to take a break, but maybe also Flavia could speak to this. I mean, I think I couldn't help but think as you all were speaking, especially as this conversation has gone forward. I just think of this kind of epistemic for lack of better words, undergirdings of where the algorithms come from. I can't help but think, maybe it's a bit cliche to say, but like the hashtag of not surprised, you know, of course it's racist, right? Of course it's doing these things. Um, yeah, so I guess I just am curious, uh, I couldn't help but be thinking like, okay, well what strategies do we have available to us? And that's, I mean, maybe, of course I super appreciate all of your critical thinking, so don't get me wrong, but I sometimes get stressed, like frustrated by this, that like, but then what, you know, where do we go from here? Um, and I thought of um, the wonderful example that was shared about um, yeah, Arabic and the lack of diacritical remark, uh, uh, marks, but it seems to me that this is one of the ways that frequently gets used, the strategy gets used is escape, but that's like a limited strategy, and I guess I'm wondering, do you all have ideas of other strategies, decolonial strategies, liberatory strategies, I guess picking up on what, what Ladipo said, yeah. Maybe I can say something about that. Yeah, but I mean, but uh, well, your question makes me think of um, several examples that I stumbled upon uh, during my research of how, yeah, specifically how to, how to, for lack of a better word, uh, decolonize the, the, the algorithm, right? Uh, 
and I think one of the examples that I encountered that uh, for me opened like other ways of uh, of thinking or maybe windows of, of hope of it is uh, changing the data sets on which these algorithms are trained um, and expose them to data sets that are not just Western white male middle aged data sets or colonial data sets. Uh, but for this, you need to also uh, adapt the, the the algorithms in the way in the way they learn about them, uh, because a lot of these data sets don't have like the structures that we understand as the, the basis. And one of these examples, which I thought was quite um, interesting as an attempt, a first attempt of doing this, is also maybe linking to Daniel. The attempt to keep alive languages that are dying, uh, spe specifically indigenous languages. And I think within language there's a, a big power because meaning and culture are embedded in the language. So one of the things that make, makes me think about uh, like the power of language, uh, specifically in this context, is for example the differentiation between um, nature and culture or nature and human. Like there are languages in cultures where that distinction is not made. And just by integrating that into the algorithm, then you're incorporating another way of thinking of nature and culture or nature and human, not as binary or like separate or opposite to each other, but rather as one thing. So I think that there is a potential of using the algorithm to understand the interconnectivity and the interdependence of other systems and other peoples and other uh, cultural context, uh, human and non-human, but the, that needs to be used from the from the basic information that you're giving the algorithm, like from the root source, or even in how the algorithm is built, like Rodrigo was pointing out. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah. I mean, e each of these examples that yeah that I gave did uh, yeah did involve you know, like the actual creation of mathematical models that um, yeah that that um, uh, yeah algorithms can be based on and that were and, and that were actually built. Yeah. So so you could apply those yeah you, you could apply those algorithms for various purposes if you wish. Uh, but in in most of these cases, the the those lines of investigation. Um, yeah, ended up, uh, yeah, for the most part, curtailed or marginalized. So they didn't. Uh, so 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 they developed at at different degrees. I would say. I would say that the Cuban information science story could develop uh, over decades, and that's a um, and that, that that's a. Uh, uh, I mean, there there is a, yeah there is an intellectual history there that even if marginalized did produce a lot of stuff. Um, it's also more or less the case of the, the Brazilian logic case. I think that, I mean, the, uh, you can yeah you can look in the in the literature of that, and there will be many algorithms based on things like para consistent logic. Um, and in the Indian case, not so much. Yeah, the, uh, I mean, even though there were these early experiments, uh, and they did produce um, they did produce mathematical models and and and, and one might say actual algorithms. Um, uh, yeah, they, they, that line of investigation didn't last very long. It just uh, just lasted a couple of years. Sorry, yeah, no, I caught that. I guess I meant like where they're doing things now. That's more what I meant. Like I understood the historical examples, but I was wondering if there's anybody building things now based on those examples that you gave. Sorry. Oh. I, I wanted to add something uh, yeah. to to your yeah. question. Yeah. You said, how do we fix? How would we do? Do we resist this logic of the algorithm? The answer is we don't. We fix the culture that created these. These are artifacts that are just a reflection of who we are. So if you, if you, generic you, not you, Angela, obviously, but if you want to fix the algorithm, you raise children who are not reproducing these patterns when they become adults and when they become engineers. That's why the, the education that we do here matters in that regard. How do we create better technology? 
by fixing the underlying structural inequalities and racist histories and gender exclusionary situations that we created ourselves in the 1600s. Until we fix that, there are not going to be any better algorithms because they are just the artificial. How, how do we create better bottles? That's what algorithms are. They're artifacts. And, and it's us who are making them shitty. Until we and you know, undo ourselves when we say about decolonize, decolonize the algorithm. No, you cannot decolonize the algorithm. We have to decolonize ourselves. And maybe if we are lucky and we are not too shitty to each other, we will stop producing this technology. Otherwise, but yeah. This touches on a very important aspect, actually, that it's common to disattach. It's, it's very common that we just disattach ourselves from the algorithm and then we end up just That's putting it as a target. That's also solutionism. I, I want to solve. No one. Yeah. What we have to solve is impossible to solve just like that. Especially it's not, not about table. just a war between us and this algorithm, and the algorithm is the target, and the next war is just robots and men. It's, it's, it's not, <laughs> that might happen in a different context, but, <laughs> but it's not like, like that. You know I my mean. love of Mechagonzilla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yes, it, indeed. The algorithm is us. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But how do you, so like, there is actually one more question, but it was just answered uh, for for you by Lauren, which said, who asked uh, regarding to Ladibo's question, I was wondering if Rodrigo could elaborate on this, this also regarding his work on alternative algorithmic models. That was so that, answer, is, that yes. is the same thing. Mauri, it's a great answer. Uh, there was some talk about Cuba. Uh, there's 100%, that's it. So the, the, the live stream started to really react to what yes. we do here, it was great. <laughs> Yeah, but I was wondering how do we reconcile? This is a more a question to raise sort of the level of abstraction a little bit because now what we get is the algorithm is a dog. It's basically what we train it to be, it's gonna become. So if we become better, the algorithm starts to reflect that in one way or another. I'm just boiling it down. How about these claims about you know, stuff like the age of spiritual machines, stuff where actually, the, I'm not agreeing no, with no, it. No, no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, but the idea that there will be this as sort of passage, you know, called the singularity. The singularity, which, yeah, right? Yes. God, I'm not going there, but let, let's just put, like, if we put the boil down to this idea of algorithm simply being followers of the human programmer, right? you know, with the hypothetical of the moment that it surpasses that because the recursive intelligence that's being generated by the sort of neural networks that are teamed up in like like whatever they are is going to exceed what the the origins are. How do we? How do we? How does the panel feel about that possibility? Um, I'm going to give you a snark. As yeah, you great. Know. So <laughs> go ahead. No, no. You, you know that I have said. I, I think that I, I have said this in conversation with you uh, that I, I have a tendency to make some tech bros like Elon Musk fans and that kind of people angry when I say that uh, the singularity has already happened, only that it didn't happen in the way that uh, these people hoped for. They always thought of the singularity in very individualistic terms, transferring your individual soul to the machine and then being able to live forever in the Uploading machine. Uploading your soul. Exactly, right. exactly. Yeah. And I have said that has, that has already happened because the machine is the collective consciousness of white cisgender men. So <laughs> we have already made that happen. Only that not on an individual level. It's not that one single man now lives in the machine. But as a collective, that's the technology we have. Right. Okay. So we do have like spiritual algorithms. Only that, well, look. <laughs> this, this is the spirit. This is right. a spirit. Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. <coughs> I want to thank everyone so much for coming, Daniel. Daniel is, I mean, we have this complicity of an ongoing dialogue for <laughs> a couple of years already. So you see now that, that interaction. Rodrigo, thank you so, so much for coming. And I hope that it's not the last time that we have you at Sandburn. Um, Mariana. Thank you so much for sharing your process with you. 
uh, with us and with, with uh, the audience and for making us part of your research. I mean, I know for sure it won't be the last time that <laughs> you will be here <laughs> amongst us. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you. Thank, thank you, you for coming.